You're listening to Talk Daredevil, a podcast about all things Daredevil in the greater Marvel Universe, brought to you by the women behind Saved Daredevil. Welcome back to the next episode of Talk Daredevil. We're very excited about today's episode, and it is going to be about Matt Corman, Chris Ward, and some of their previous work. Today with me, I have Christine. Hi. And Shelby. Hello. So we are specifically today going to focus on Matt Corman and Chris Ord's show that they worked on for five seasons, Covert Affairs. Yay. (laughs) Which we've all watched. (laughs) This podcast is almost a year in the making because Mm -hmm. the team at Talk Daredevil won. We were big fans of the show when it originally aired, which was the weirdest coincidence when they announced these showrunners. So weird. And we wanted to rewatch the show in its entirety before doing this podcast and get it just right. So I guess like, yeah, the very first thing is we are a Daredevil podcast. Why are we devoting a whole episode to covert affairs? Well, because it's probably the best known, longer run work of this uh, this particular duo, too. Like, I mean, they're working together and now they're working together again. And I guess they, I think they work together on other projects, too, I would imagine. But um, I mean, this was the, the show that came up when everyone was like, wait, wait, who are these people? Oh, OK. So the Covert Affairs guys. So, yeah. So this is uh, the show that gets uh, that got mentioned a lot back when this was announced. And it ran for five seasons. And I think I only watched it like after the fact, but it was still almost a decade ago that I watched it for the first time. And then I rewatched um, ahead of this pod, although that's been a few weeks too, but <laughs> hopefully. It'll, Sorry, uh, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Shelby was the one who took her sweet time. Let's just <laughs> point our cyber I fingers. Guess. No, no, we're, but that's fine. We're all in like different phases relative to our most recent um, rewatch. But anyway, people have been, you know, talking about this show in, in conjunction with that announcement and some people have been kind of skeptical. A lot of people haven't seen it. So we kind of want to offer you like a, a, a deep dive into the show and some of our you know thoughts on it and and how it may compare and contrast to what's coming up uh, with their next adventure in Daredevil Land. Yeah, I think it should just be enough that this is where Rhiannon and I just met and fell in love. That should be enough reason for anybody. I was about to say, <laughs> should we tell them the real reason? <laughs> <laughs> this is your guys' origin story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Shelby and I originally met and geeked out over covert affairs and then moved on to Daredevil after it was canceled. Yeah, I feel like we probably we probably would have been drawn to each other across the fandom world at some point. This just made it happen sooner rather than later. It, yeah, it feels like the, the stars were going to align for you guys eventually somehow. Meanwhile, I had to fangirl alone over this show. And I also didn't actually, because I was watching it at such a kind of a, a weird time in between seasons, other things came up that I didn't actually finish it until I did this most recent rewatch. And and that wasn't because I didn't like it. I liked it perfectly fine. It was just sort of other things come up and so on. But I really, I really did enjoy it. Well, and I think that I think that's a nice segue into our first topic is just sort of this show came out in a very different era of television. And I feel like some people discovered it, you know, when it initially came out in the old world of television. And some people sort of caught it as it moved into what it became later in the series. It's a five season series. So you probably caught it, you know, as it moved into a different era of television or as just sort of television in the world changed. Yeah, even I didn't catch it until the season finale of season three. I happened to be at my sister's house and was like, what is the show? So I sort of started from season three. And back. So even I didn't catch it like when it premiered. I caught it when it premiered, but I did not like it. And I think that's something that a lot of people that, you know, like they saw this news, they saw these showrunners did jingle all the way and they did covert affairs. They Googled covert affairs. They saw that image of yeah Piper Parabo and the Louboutins with a gun that they used for the that they used for the poster for every single season. And they were like, what the huh? <laughs> and I sort of saw that the first season, you know, the first season you watch it and it's this perfectly dropped out gorgeous woman running around in Louboutins, like 
fighting bad guys. And there was just nothing about that I could relate to. And I was like, man, I really want to like this show. It has a lot of stuff I really enjoy. And so I, I caught it again in season three and really loved it at that point. So I think that is a nice first message for people. If you're if you're going in and you jumped in and you just like saw that first episode or something and you're like, what is this crap? That isn't necessarily representative of the show. No. And like you said before, it's, it was a different time of TV and USA Network, along with some of these other broadcast cable networks were trying something different. They wanted to get into the drama game. And it was a time of like what white collar, burn notice, covert affairs, psych, monk, all that was going on at the same time. Yeah, I mean, and even now, like, when I was rewatching it, it, you can kind of tell that it's from a different era. Like, I, I mean, you notice that it's a different kind of show than, you know, most of the shows you see on TV these days. And I think that's just like a natural evolution, uh, especially over the first two seasons. It's got a very, very episodic format. Like, there's kind of a case of the week thing to it, except that the cases, of course, are various, like, spy missions that she has to go on and uh, and she does go and I mean it's on location all over the world so um, it's um, she really does go places which is that in itself is kind of nice and escapist and I mean you do really get to travel to these different places and you know watch her walk through you know cities you may or may not have been to and it, it's it's kind of fun that way but it's very episodic and you don't see that as much anymore but they do it really um, I think they do it well yeah. And I mean, well, and I think that episodic nature, it, it's a very villain of the week, you know, mystery of the week and all of that. And I mean, if we have listeners that know nothing about what Covert Affairs is about, maybe we should take a step back. And <laughs> this is Blue Sky era of USA Network. Um, their, their motto at the time was characters welcome. They wanted unique characters and all of that. But some of the overarching executive <laughs> direction and this actually, this came up on Burn Notice. Burn Notice was actually supposed to take place in New Jersey. But the notes that came in from the network was, we like the show, but we want it to be somewhere sexier. So they moved it to Miami. Everything, like they wanted characters, but everything had to be sexy. I mean, I mean, re- remember Matt Bomer? I mean, can he get sexier and prettier than Matt Bomer on White Collar? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, and that's, I mean, like everything was pretty. It was bright. It was sunny. It was episodic. These shows were designed to air, like, if I remember correctly, like, USA Network aired these series mostly, like, through the summer in the off-season. They weren't meant to compete with things like West Wing, which probably was going off the air around the time Covert Affairs came on the air. You know, they weren't designed to compete with, like, your high, high highbrow episodic television. They were to give something over the summer to watch and be happy about and all of that. But all of these shows ended up being very good. Um, the Covert Affairs itself is about Annie Walker, a spy that was pulled off of the farm, pulled out of her CIA training early to lure her ex-boyfriend. Her ex-boyfriend was a spy that had gone rogue and they were trying to lure him back. She has a handler, Augie Anderson, who is a, a veteran spy who was blinded in Iraq. So there's a blind character, which we'll get into that, I'm sure. Um, And so it's about her journey of like being a young spy and developing into a really good spy. So it started very episodic and then started having these longer arcs as television moved towards series where you had a long overarching arc. And I don't remember like the big impetus because like I remember very clearly remember a change in television in that time period that, you know, like it was okay just having like villain of the week type episodic television. And then there were a few series that just like really pushed it into, oh, no, we need a story that goes throughout the season that we get to the end of. You're probably spot on that it's very much kind of a change in TV in general taking place during that time. But at the same time, I think it's also kind of inevitable when you spend a lot of time with these characters, because you've seen this with a lot of shows that start out very episodic and they just kind of eventually like each character just accrues sort of more and more in that world kind of experience and you learn more about them and more background and more like there's more fodder for just kind of 
going a little bit deeper and extending. And of course, you, you spend time with them over a number of you know seasons. They develop relationships with recurring characters. And it just I think it's almost like a physical kind of power that just drives you a little bit in that direction, too, just with, you know, the passing of time. Um, Shelby, you wanted to talk about how these were television writers writing for television. Yeah, it just goes back to a time when TV was TV. I mean, do you guys remember when we had like mid-season finales? You had to wait. There's a hiatus. You had to build up to the big finale finale. This also was a TV show that came out on the air. Everybody watched it live and we were all tweeting about it live. So it was Mm -hmm. like we would get on Twitter when the new episode was coming out and we'd all be talking about it. And a lot of the writers would get on Twitter and like talk with us. And that is how Shelby and I got to know Tamara Becker Wilkerson, who was a writer on Covert Affairs wrote some of the most impactful episodes. And, you know, we were just like being very passionate with her. And we actually became friends with her. I mean, like we've hung out with her in person and stuff. And she ended up writing on Daredevil season three. So we have already seen Covert Affairs writers in the Daredevil writers room. That's true. And also it does like, there's not a lot of shows I watch these days where it is a week to week thing where I would get on Twitter But I'd still see some of that around with the CW show. Some of the actors will get on there and live tweet their episodes. And it does take me back to that time when we did that week to week. We'd wait for previews to come out. We'd discuss the preview of the episode. The clips would come out. And we would just get hyped from week to week. And I think that has been missed with this binge model TV. And I'm happy that streamers are trying to go back to television for television. And I think that's something that Disney Plus has sort of struggled with. So I hope with Daredevil Born Again, we get back on track with TV for TV. And I think some of what like, you know, in all of our discussions about Corman and Ord and them being television writers is they are used to wrapping up a story in 45 minutes, yet still leaving you wanting for more. Having those episodic villain of the week type stories while still having character growth and arcs. uh, That's the one thing in this rewatch was there were little little nuggets laid in the first season that paid off in season four or five, mostly season four. Yeah, you could tell that they they know what they're doing when it comes to not only episodic, but long form storytelling as well. Yeah, if you want the best of two worlds, you're going to have to to handle both. And we actually discussed on our last podcast uh, that Shelby and I were on that uh, one kind of nice thing about an episodic show coming up for Daredevil is that it, it is also kind of reminiscent of a, a particular era of superhero comics as well. And money-wise, do we know, um, did we ever figure out how much they got to spend per episode? Oh, on Covert Affairs? Yeah, yeah, was it like? It was over a million, because I clearly remember that there were some points, um, Chris Gorham, when he got to direct some episodes towards the end of the series... He made some comments about, you know, they're putting millions of dollars in my hands. So I know it was in the millions. Yeah. Was it was it a big budget in 2010 money? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Because now now we've got now we've got like three hundred million dollar seasons of TV. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think they were. They, they were obviously not like big budget TV money because there was a lot at the time that was very prominent about how much they did with such a little budget. Mm-hmm. Like they're especially their international filming. Mm-hmm. So they planned out very well. They would put the entire crew on a plane. They could take a crew of like eight people to Istanbul and film for a week and work that into several episodes. And I think we're starting to see that on Daredevil already. And I guess here is where we might need spoiler warnings, but I'm not going to go into any details. I am not going to provide any spoilers. There's nothing that we know from all of this, but they are going and like sitting at one location, like in Harlem for several days and doing filming. And they're going and they're sitting at one location in Yonkers and for several days and filming. And I imagine we're seeing that same thing that they did on Covert Affairs, where they have written so that they can go on location to one location and film stuff to go into several episodes at one time. Yeah, because that's what we talked about that last week, too, about how when we see these pictures, It's not necessarily in order. They don't film in sequence. This could be stuff that is used way down the road. Like you said, get get this knocked out out of the way before they go in studio and really like lock it down. I'm amazed, uh, if going back to COVID affairs, that because they do spend so much time on location that they were able to keep the budget that low. And like you're saying, if they're smart about how they film things, they can squeeze a lot out of that. 
On the other hand, it's a very clever way to give sort of a premium feel to a show that's not at its baseline that expensive to do. And um, they also don't have dozens of main characters. They do have a a small-ish kind of core crew, and then they do have some recurring characters. But I think that, too, kind of probably keeps the budget a little bit lower than it would be if they had, like, a, you know, uh, (laughs) uh, tons and tons of actors. Um, But, uh, yeah, you mentioned Chris Gorham, too. We should maybe probably tell our listeners who haven't watched the show that that's the guy who plays Augie Anderson, who's the handler and the blind guy. (laughs) Yeah. Same person. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, well, and let's go into the show a little bit. We've got this bright, sunny, gorgeous toned show. And then we have this character leading a double life. And I think a lot of people like on the surface are like, oh, it's just the CIA. She's just a government worker. It's just the CIA. But it is very much a double life. Yeah, it's so hard watching her trying to keep her secret with her sister because she does love her sister so much. Also, like she loves her sister a lot, but it's also like there's such a huge contrast between her life and her sister's life. Like her sister is like a a stay at home mom who starts a catering business out of her home. Uh, And, you know, she puts up a website and it's like, I mean, and just the contrast between their two different lives and the way Annie kind of has to navigate that and, like, I guess, talk about her pretend job. And <laughs> and her bruises, um, like, coming home with the, like, having to put the, like, bag of peas on her head and, like, just yeah, a stapler, yeah. stapler injury. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I mean, like, her cover is that she works at the Smithsonian. So her sister's always like, man, I didn't realize the museum was so dangerous. <laughs> like, she's either she sends the postcards or Augie will send the postcard where she's supposed to be in like Omaha and she's in Paris or somewhere. You know? well, although she she does have a pretty good cover story for how she travels so much because she does, she has as her pretend jobs in the acquisitions or something. And yeah. she, yes, if they find it. something that the Smithsonian would like to add to their collections, that's something like she would go to go to look at um, ostensibly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And her sister's, her sister's always trying to set her up on, like, blind dates. You need to find a man. <laughs> and he's just like, no. <laughs> well, and they do, they do juggle. I mean, they even go into, at some point, I think it's in season two, like, having a love life while leading a double life. Like, she does have Dr. Scott. That oh bless Dr. Scott. You know? <laughs> and but, but, I mean, but it really is. Like, when you watch this show... Through the lens of, okay, these writers are going to take on a masked superhero. Mm -hmm. It is totally like, yeah, yeah, they've done it. I mean, Mm -hmm. like, she's not wearing a mask when she goes out and does her secret life. And of course, when she really does have to tell Danielle, when she, when it becomes like an issue of safety and she does have to tell her, it's, it doesn't go like it's not happy sunshine rainbows, like kind of like the Matt and Foggy. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And Danielle is the sister. Yeah, she has to tell her sister about her secret life in the episode that Benedict Wong shows up in. Oh, you know, I'm a Wonger. Wongers. <laughs> and a Wongers for life. <laughs> Wongers. So, like, they have, I mean, which leads into another one of, like, the things that we know is doing this. They make amazing use of one-time or drop-in special characters. Like, Ooh. obviously, Benedict Wong wasn't Benedict Wong when he was in this episode. but. I mean, and he wasn't, you know, like the amazing actor, well-known actor he is now. But his character comes in for one episode, has depth, has reason, has purpose. And then we never see him again. Yeah. And that's a very, speaking of like, you know, how the tone varies with the show. That that particular episode is a super, super heavy, dark but kind of life-affirming um, type of episode. But that really touches on, you know all kinds of different notes. It's really not not just, you know, happy, levity type of storytelling. It, it really, um, yeah, heavy. Yeah. We would have the most fun, too, on Twitter. I was just going to say we would have the most fun, too, when the drop-in characters would appear, like Agent Rasabi and Barber. Like, we just had fun with those. That was, yes. That is what, the, the real time of Covert Affairs as it was airing, some of those side characters were some of the best to interact with, like on Twitter and everything. Um, but even some of them, I mean, they were very, they, they very much remind me of like Brett Mahoney and Turk mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and some of these, you know, they're characters that are not supposed to be in the spotlight. They're not supposed to be who you're focusing on, but 
they came in, they did an amazing job, and they kept them recurring through all five seasons. I remember in season five, there's a moment where I thought Wasabi was dead. Wasabi. I just called him yeah, Wasabi. We, we, called him, we called him Wasabi. There's, there's an FBI agent that occasionally pops up and interacts with the CIA, and you know he's Agent Wasabi. And there was a moment in season five where I thought they killed him off, and I was ready to... I, I don't know. The world. I, yeah. Yeah, I was just emotionally un, unable to process that. It's the way we were, too, with Barber, with Eric Barber, who uh, worked in the tech department with Augie. He was sort of Augie's, like, little buddy. And we were like, protect Barber at all costs. Barber would drop in and have, like, a couple lines and, like, steal the scene. Yeah. I mean, I can totally see this with Marvel characters dropping in. You know, Mm -hmm. I can see them working She-Hulk into this, popping in for two episodes, having meaning, having depth, having purpose disappearing and it feeling like it's part of the story and wholesome yeah you know, just how they would pop in this show there was a israeli spy ayal that would occasionally pop in for a few episodes and there was sort of a will they won't they love interest thing going on and then he would pop out and it they did a really great job with that through the seasons and i could totally see them doing a good job with that on daredevil yeah, just in general, just the way char- characters are handled, the way I think I mentioned on the last uh, episode that uh, that I think the the way the dialogue is written is really, really good, too. It's like you get, I mean, in, in a show that's not as well written, you might have characters that show up only sort of as props to serve some purpose for the main character and, you know, lacking kind of a soul or whatever. <laughs> Um, on screen, but this is sort of the opposite of that. I think they they really make every character count and make them interesting and give them purpose. And as I said, like just the way they interact and the dialogues, it all feels very authentic and natural, which is hard to accomplish in such in a world that's just so your average person is not ever going to get um, come close to that kind of very extreme lifestyle. <laughs> so to speak, like where, right. you know, you almost get killed every episode um, for Annie. She's a, she's a survivor, uh, but um, but it's a, it's a very sort of foreign milieu. Uh, but at the same time, they make all these characters really human and relatable and, and all of them have a, a part to play in the bigger story. And I think they, they nailed that. So I, as someone who really enjoys those kinds of the just character moments, you know, scenes that are, you know, you're not just chasing your next action scene, you're making a scene between two people really, really count. And to have showrunners that can, that can value that aspect of making a TV show and just something, yeah, I, I, I love that. Yeah, I think this huge, here she is, it's, it's this huge world, she's traveling all over the world, seems so small. Like it's, it's really back to like a family unit. All these people come in and play a part and you're never like, oh my God, here's Joan and Arthur again, or here's this person again. It always feels so close knit and meaningful. Yeah, and Joan and Arthur for people. I just feel like I'm like yeah. I'm your narrator here, telling the listener yeah. who has to see this show. Joan and Arthur are sort of like the the, the parental types uh, of this show. They are um, they are married the and they're they're bosses. Yeah, uh, different kinds of bosses as a as a show um, goes on, but um, mentors and and sort of the people who've been around for a while and. They're not in the field as much, but they are sort of um, major characters in the row, right? And then speaking of characters, we also, I know there's this one character we were talking about before that's kind of um, a Fisk-like type of character. Do we want to oh talk about him? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's where I was saying, like, the breadcrumbs laid in the early episodes. There is a character that... In season one, and this and this is where like the rewatch was so helpful. It's like when you watch this character, you can see the almost exact words coming out of Fisk's mouth. Uh, and it's Henry Wilcox. I'm getting chills, like just thinking about it. Get, ugh, it just, yeah, it's so good. He's so good. He's so good. I mean, he's just sort of a general baddie that exists in the background. Like he's not really the villain of the show until like the fourth season. He's just a very smarmy, uncomfortable presence for the first three seasons. You can tell he's a puppet master, even early on. 
And they do that from like a CIA perspective. Like it's the CIA. They're used to playing mind games. They're used to emotionally manipulating people. They're used to walking this very gray line between good and bad. And there's a lot of those you know, decisions and all that. And this guy, he might as well be Wilson Fisk and some of the the just manipulation. Yeah. And also being that kind of behind the scenes power player who doesn't, I mean, I'm thinking of Fisk, you know, from season one, where where the whole thing is he's doing all of this from the shadows and the same kind of setup with, with Henry Wilcox. And especially as we were watching this, of course, I mean, we've seen the show before, then Daredevil came, we've all seen Daredevil, uh, obviously. Uh, and then having done that and then rewatching Covert Affairs, it was really like, oh my gosh, He's such a Fisk-like kind of character. I mean, we were all commenting on that. It just seemed so, yeah, so many parallels uh, that it's really kind of inescapable when you... I mean, of course, there are other there have been other characters like that in, in television, but it also takes a certain amount of skill to write a character like that, who, as you're saying, like, you can kind of you get the clues early on, but the machinations of this person, the kind of thing that will have to play out over time, and... To have both, like, as we were saying before, the episodic skills, but also to have the long-term storytelling threads going from the outset. And Wilcox is such a great example of those um, those two different kind of timelines or formats. He's just so good. I don't know what else to say. You guys are saying it all. He's, it's just, and you really have to, like, watch them both to appreciate, I think. Watch Daredevil and Covert Affairs to really get what we're saying. But it is that total, that arc of like when you get to episode nine, he's like, blah, here's the plan. I had laid it out since the beginning. You know, none of you were making your real decisions. Because when it first starts, like you said, it's just little bits. You get little, he visits the DPD, you know, and you're like, is he bad? Is he full on bad? I don't know. And then by the time he's full on bad, you're like, oh, my God, this guy, he's ruthless. I should have seen this coming. I'm so dumb. Yeah. Yeah. They don't give you a beheading with a car door in the beginning to... No. To let you know. <laughs> um, because it's Blue Sky TV. But they do, man, they go some, they go to such dark places with the sun shining. Shout out to Greg Itzen. Rest in peace. I mean, he was, he, he was the best. But um, speaking of characters, do we want to, is this a time to talk about the uh, second character on the show is pretty close to being almost like a co-lead of this particular show. Do we want to talk about Augie? So, I mean, so we talked about the big bad. So the, you know, the second, I guess the number two billing on the show is Augie Anderson, played by Chris Gorham, um, who is blind. He has no superpowers. I mean, yes, no he does. Su- <laughs> he does have high tech cane. That's super yeah. high tech CIA tech. He has CIA <laughs> equipment. <laughs> um. Yeah, so he is, you know, a former spy. Well, he is a spy. I'm sorry. I did not mean to uh, (laughs) tarnish his name by saying former. Uh, He's a CIA employee uh, that also is an army veteran, blinded in Iraq. Um, And what is it? it, Wait, what is it that Foggy says that that Matt does when beautiful women walk in the room? All he has that questionable, what what is it that Foggy says? Oh, (laughs) oh, if there's a beautiful woman in the room with questionable... Uh, I can't remember the character. That all yeah, he has he that. Has that skill. <laughs> yes, he's a ladies' man, um, mm-hmm. and you know, very much trying to prove himself. You know that he's still capable as a spy, still has value in the field and stuff like that, and does get a lot of action. So that's what I mean. There mm-hmm. is in yeah. covert affairs a lot of a blind character in fights, really good fights. Because they they make sense. Like this is what you would have to do to gain an advantage in the kind of situation where he you know where he's in. So um, you have to get the villain in a hallway, right? And and speaking of fights, as an aside, before going back to Augie, I noticed too, like how also Annie's fight scenes, the, like the way they're choreographed, because a lot of times she will be fighting someone who's bigger and stronger than her. Which a lot of times in TV, they just kind of hand wave that away. Like, that's not going to be a factor. But, of course, in real life, it is a factor. But they do show how you would technically go about, you know, evening the odds in that kind of situation. Where she will, like, pull someone close and, like, use that, uh, usually a, a bigger guy, like, use, you know, his mass against him. And I kind of, like, the way 
it's like they're taking all these things into account when doing the fight scenes, which make them feel uh, more realistic than they would have in less competent hands. And the same is true with, I guess, um, the, I mean, he doesn't have as many fight scenes, of course, but Augie does have some fight scenes. And the same kind of thing is true there, where they, they really think about, like, a, okay, if how would you try to gain an advantage if the other person can see and you can't? Even though you're a skilled fighter, you need to keep them, you know, close and... Yeah, so it's like they really think about sort of as someone who <laughs> likes the whole like superhero science aspect. They really don't forget about, you know, physics and stuff like that when they write their fight scenes, which I, I appreciate. Oh, I was just going to say, too, because Annie, she doesn't even go to the gun. I, t- I can't remember how far we are into it before she starts toting a gun. And Augie is the one who pulls her aside and trains her like you're, you really need to learn how to fight like up close. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, that's what I started off talking about the poster for the show where it always had her with a gun. And they actually they were like, even the actors on the show were like, she doesn't carry a gun. Like, this is the stupidest poster because <laughs> she literally never carries a gun. And every season it would be a picture of her with a gun. Um, she doesn't carry a gun until late in season three, season four. Yeah. But they if anybody like is jumping into an episode, season three, episode two is a great one for seeing Augie fighting with Annie and those situations that you're talking about, Christine. You know, they they very conscientiously put all of the fights in a tight and closed area because that made it easier. But there's a nice fight there that like starts in an elevator and then it moves to outdoor metal stairs like a fire escape. Um, They move to the fire escape and, you know, there's all of the technicality of that and, you know, and how things can go wrong and how things can go well. And like a later, like a running escape, you know, there's there's running through alleys and stuff like that. Um, I think it's a good episode to look at to see sort of mm-hmm. their strength in those yeah, areas. Yeah, it also plays on the fact, too, that when you care about somebody, it's different. No matter if you don't want it to be different, you think you can just play along like you're used to and then somebody that you care about with you on this mission you do change the way you do things uh getting back to uh to augie because i think a- another thing uh we should point out in terms of like yes this is a blind character the actor is not blind um and he does have there are some episodes that do have like flashbacks to before he was blinded there's an episode that shows you shows the audience how that whole thing happened and there are also other flashback scenes to parts of his life before he lost his sight and and stuff. So, but in general, I was thinking during this rewatch, knowing that these guys are now working on Daredevil Born Again and they used to work on Covered Affairs and that had a very, uh, I mean, possibly the most prominent blind character in television history. I mean, because it's it's like he's listed after uh, Piper and Parabo. And I was thinking that these guys really do seem to actually enjoy exploring his life as a blind character not i mean of course he's much 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 more than that but i mean they don't they seem to find it interesting writing a blind character which i think is a good prerequisite for wanting you know for for writing daredevil um as well and then of course augie also tells like a a, a painful number of blind jokes um (laughs) during this show (laughs) so there is that too but i mean they do seem to take it seriously this kind of I guess what I'm getting at. Yeah, they, I think it's the perfect balance. It's not in your face every episode, but it's not glossed over. And the character, grow, I mean, all of these characters over five seasons, they treat Augie Anderson, they, they sort of insinuate at the first episode that it's maybe a year or so after he's lost his sight, that it's not that long after he lost his sight. So the character after five seasons is a very different character in a lot of those regards and moving through that that journey and some of the emotional steps along the way which i mean like one of the one of the wishes i always have with daredevil is that they explore that arc of him temporarily getting his vision back like an emotional arc of that from some you know from some angle i think they could handle that well from some of the stuff that they did with augie and the character growth and development but going back to fights they did the fights very well as far as putting people in the right situations for it to be the right fight. But they also had, um, I think we wanted to talk about this sort of, you know, the, the women in this show and their athleticism and their fights 
it was a very balanced show. Once I got past, like like I said, I almost didn't watch it in the beginning because of the Louboutins and the blonde haired, gorgeous woman running around getting whatever she wanted because she was cute. Yeah, pilot episodes are tough. You usually do have to get past a pilot, but But once you get past all of that, there are women in this show that go through all kinds of stuff and hold their own and have amazing arcs. Yeah, there's I don't think the men ever come in and like deal the show. No. Or the, or they or where they play like the back seat to the to the men ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I would suspect that part of that could be just the fact that they are so invested in like every character having a story. Where it's like if you if you go into it with that mindset, you're more likely to succeed from that kind of perspective. Every character needs to have their own motivations for doing things, their own backstory, um, you know, their own way of, you know, just being unique people. And if you go into it that way, then that's a way of making sure that your characters are not cliches or stereotypes or whatever. Like everyone gets to be a full character and, and they're just really good at that. And I think that's, that's the way to, to approach it. So I, I really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what they're going to do with all these. Like we were again talking about on the previous pod about we have all these new characters coming in on Daredevil Born Again that we don't know yet what kind of characters are going to, like what what characters these actors are playing, uh, whether they are established characters from the comics or if they're new characters. We have no idea, but I think regardless, I'm just looking forward to seeing how they handle a lot of these. Side characters, because if there's one thing I sometimes I'm sometimes missing from from the comics, especially in in recent years, it's like, you know, there's Matt Murdock as a character is someone who needs to have a world around him to both ground the character and also just to populate this world that he lives in. And um, yeah, I see these guys just from that perspective, just see these guys as a good match for the project that is Daredevil Born Again. Same. Um, it would have been like COVID Affairs would not be the show it was without the supporting characters and the characters that would come in at different episodes. The uh, They made it rich. Yeah. Those characters yeah. added, they added yeah. depth and complexity. And, yes, yes, that. Um, they, they made the world deeper without making it overly complicated. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where, you know, for the era that Disney Plus is in, and, you know, I feel like Disney Plus is trying to get to this where they want a show that is lighter, you know, we keep hearing lighter tone, brighter and all of this, you know, some of that is they're not going for something complex. You're not going to have something that like you have to sit down and draw a diagram afterwards and all of that to figure out who is who and what their situations are. But it's not going to be in the first episode. There's a breadcrumb laid that you're like, Oh, this is moving towards, I mean, you know, like, so we talked about Henry Wilcox as the bad guy. Like, yes, when he shows up, you know, I, it's like, oh, yeah, this is, this is like, uh, maybe not a good person. And they even like, by the end of the first season, he's charged with treason. So, you know, you're like, okay, he is a bad guy. But, you know, it's not like, oh, but he's clearly the villain. You know, you're not... And and that's what I want most from all of these Marvel shows is, you know, I don't want an episode three to figure out where they're going to in episode nine. I want to be surprised along the way. And I think they do a really good job of making it surprising without making it overly complicated along the way. If you are in the U.S. and you are wanting to watch the show, it is on Peacock. We have... Uh, I, think you freebie, I think it's on freebie too, whatever that is. These days, that's some kind of app. I think it's on there. Or if you were like me and you bought it way back in the day, you'll have it forever. Booyah. But wherever you stream NBC Universal stuff. And if you're anywhere else in the world, uh, I would recommend, actually, this is a good site in general. There's a site called justwatch.com. I think they have an app too, uh, where you just enter all the, you know, you can enter your country and all the various streaming channels you subscribe to and whatever, and just search for like movies, TV shows, whatever, and it'll tell you where you can watch them, depending on where you are in the world. So um, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> for some of you, it, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to find it everywhere, but you can, you can, you can try. <laughs> and in North America, definitely um, shouldn't have any problems finding it. You know, if you can't find it, just, just reach out to Shelby or me on Twitter, and we will just pretty much tell you all about whatever episode you want to know about. Yes. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> That's crazy. So for those of you that do want to jump in and you don't want to watch all five seasons, which I highly recommend. Yeah, we wanted to give you a little bit of recommendations. The first recommendation that I gave everybody back when they were announced as showrunners was if you start in season one and it is not your cup of tea, jump to season three. Um, Seasons one and two are a little bit, you know, they're light and fluffy. The tone distinctly changes in season three and it becomes a slightly different show. Yeah, I was trying to um, remember who's got some good ones, too. And I was trying to remember... Is it World Leader Pretend is the one with, yeah, with Benedict Wong. Okay, so that's two episode, I mean, season two, episode 10. If you do start in season one, I really liked season one, episode three, I believe. To me, it was a great uh, example of an episode that is light and pretty. Like, it all takes place during the day on Capitol Hill. And there's a girl, it is about a spy in Congress, you know, and the CIA is trying to figure out who is spying. And it ends up being super dark. Like, they totally mess up this woman's life. There end up being people with their lives in danger and, you know, fight scenes and everything. So I think it's a great example of a very dark tone in a light and fluffy show. Yeah. And if you um, if you want the Augie episodes, it's um, 107 and 207. Those are and the- 302 for the fight scene. Yeah, I never know the uh, names or numbers of any episodes, but I will say that there's like one episode where they go to my hometown of Stockholm. You do not have to watch that episode. Uh, That is not one of my favorite episodes. There are so many good episodes, though. So I would recommend the ones that (laughs) that Rhiannon and Shelby have mentioned. And uh, and again, all of season three and I think season four are really, really good. Super just tense. And and yeah. Uh Remember these episode titles uh, better because they would be, all be song titles from, like, say, David Bowie. Like, season three are all David Bowie song titles. They pick an artist yeah. and use uh, – that would be the title of the episodes. But And we can put it in the show notes, too. We can – if we come up with some more episodes we're, that we could recommend, we could put that in the show notes after we're done. Definitely a lot we could say about this this show. And I think we've touched on some of the more important things we wanted to mention. and. And just, I guess, to conclude, we're just, you know, for us, it was good news to hear that this particular team would be uh, heading up uh, Daredevil Born Again. So we're curious to see what they do with it and knowing what we know from COVID affairs. Yeah. If you go away from this podcast with nothing, feel a little bit better about these showrunners taking over Daredevil. That's, that's what we hoped to communicate to everybody. And if you aren't convinced, reach out to Shelby or me on Twitter and we will just keep convincing you because mm-hmm. we will hype. It we really will. does feel like a great fit. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. And um, I know we were sad when it got canceled, just like you're sad when everything gets canceled. But going back and watching all five seasons, it does even feel complete to me now. So if you do watch the whole five seasons, you can rest assured in that, that they do know how to tie up the show, too. On that, I want to leave with one thing. When we started doing the research for this pod, Shelby found some quotes from Matt Corman and Chris Ward. Not about this show. Like, they haven't done any. As far as I know, they've done zero interviews about taking over Daredevil. But there was a previous show that they were hired for. I don't think it ever got made. And the question was, did you just take inspiration from the original series or did you want to take some things directly from it? And Matt Corman's response was, when there's a format, you have to make certain decisions about what to honor and what to take, and then where you want to diverge. Even within the pilot, the original showrunner made the decision to introduce some new characters that rippled forward. The three of us, and it's the original showrunner, Chris and Matt, sat down before the other writers came and talked about the series and some of the key things that they really liked. I'm sort of paraphrasing some of this just because the details don't matter. It's your tone. Um, and then some of the areas they were going to have to create. What it does do is give you proof of concept. You know that it's a good arena for a show, but I think it can be a mistake to be too faithful be- to it because it's its own thing. And then they go on and they talk about you know, the show that they were adapting was in another country. And so, you know, bringing it to America, it's different. Uh, the original series was very dark in a way that doesn't allow the audience in fully. So, you know, I, that quote, I just sort of paraphrased some of that because to put it into context here. But, you know, that's from their own mouth 
about a previous adaptation that they were taking of a property. I, we just thought that was an interesting quote about them. I like this one, too, from, from Chris Ord before we go. It's always been about the collision between Annie's spy life and her personal life. That still is the main core. It's just a question of how we explore the whole idea. So I like that quote, yeah. too. That's a good one. back to Matt. Yeah, Matt's double life. So. so I think that's everything that we had to talk about today. You guys want my covert affairs uh, slash Walkerson playlist? Just hit me up. I'll give you the Spotify link. I still pull that one up every now and then. So thank you for listening. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to Talk Daredevil. For more information about Saved Daredevil, including links to our socials, please visit us at savedaredevil.com. Remember, Murdoch's always get back up.